Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Interesting and Sexy, a podcast dedicated to spreading the awareness and visibility of intersex people, as well as discussing issues slash experiences about queer life, being different, and all other things interesting and sexy. Um, I just wanted to start the episode um, by saying thank you so much to everyone who listened to the first episode and gave such amazing feedback. Um, It's really nice to know that people were listening and uh, people are really interested in this topic. Before I switch to the interviewing mode, (laughs) I'm going to do a FAQ type episode um, just because I get a lot of repetitive questions here um, on my TikTok, on my Instagram, and um, I just want to have somewhere that I can lead people where all of the uh, commonly asked questions are going to be answered. Um, So yeah, I'm just going to read some of the comments that I got sent in. Uh, But the ones that I chose are the ones that I get asked the most um, being intersex. And this is just the questions that I get asked the most. Um, I'm sure other intersex people have different questions being asked, but these are mine. Okay, so um, the first question that I get uh, a lot is, if you don't have a vagina, how do you have sex? And I got this a lot after I posted my last video and I was kind of mentioning that story about, you know, realizing that I didn't have a vagina and I didn't really go into full description about how I had to make one for myself. So um, the first part of the answer is there are a lot of other ways that you can have sex that don't involve penetration. And the second part is, um, well, I just have sex like everybody else when I want to have that kind of sex because I have a vagina now. I actually made one um, myself. And yeah, a lot of people were also commenting saying, you know, how did your parents not notice or how did no one notice until you were this age? Like, I don't believe you. You're a liar. Like, blah, blah, blah. Um, But, you know, and, and it's all these dudes that just don't know what the anatomy of a vagina looks like. So, for everyone out there, um, the vagina is is just the uh, actual hole in which you give birth through slash have your period from slash have sex in. Uh, there's a hole outside that is not called the vagina and I had the hole outside. Um, I just didn't have the vaginal canal, uh, but I do have one now, um, which brings me to the second question. Um did you have surgery to make a functional vagina for yourself? And no, I didn't. I the Surgery was an option. It was something we were debating whether we wanted to do. Uh, but when my doctor was, you know, fishing around down there, checking everything out, um, uh, they measured that. It was long enough that you could start fitting something inside it. Um, so we opted to go for dilation instead because I had already had surgery that year for my hernias and I didn't really want to go in and have another surgery. So, um, we opted for a process called dilation and, um, it's, it kind of, I don't know, it's easy to explain, but it's hard to explain. It's kind of like these, uh, plastic sticks, tubes, miniature dildo looking things. Um, and they start off, I think the smallest one was about the length of my finger and then they go up in size. Um, kind of like when, when you see, you know, like the small little baby butt plugs and then like the huge ones. And there's like a kit where you're like stretching it out. That's kind of like what I was doing, except it was, you know, not, not as extreme. It just went to normal size. Um, and it was terrible. Yeah. I didn't have a great time doing it. I didn't enjoy doing it at all. Uh, I was, you know, in this part of my life where I was ready to have sex and I was ready to, uh, do all of the other stuff that my friends were doing, but there was this massive block in the way, um, where, 
I couldn't enjoy myself because it was, yeah, very painful if I tried to do anything. And I was doing my dilation process. I was supposed to do it every night, you know, and it, it wasn't fun. Uh, the doctor suggested that I watch porn or do it while I'm doing that kind of stuff because when you're turned on, uh, your vagina becomes more stretchy. And, uh, but it, it just really took the mood out of it when I was like trying to have me time, you know? So, um, I, I did it, you know, begrudgingly and it, it was, you know, something that I was just like, no one's ever going to fucking relate to this bullshit. But, um, but then I got to a point where I was kind of on the third one or something like this. And I was like, okay, you know, it's, it's, it's sizable enough. It still wasn't like super long. It was, it was still, <laughs> it was still rather small, but, um, then I started dating this, uh, guy who is, is like still a close friend of mine, one of a, a uh, really great person. And, um, I kind of was like, okay, I have an idea. If the doctor wants me to stretch it out when I'm turned on, then I'm going to have to ask someone to help me out. And, um, I ended up sharing my secret and confiding in him saying, this is the situation. Like, um, you know, this sucks, but like, I really want this to change in my life. And he was like, thanks for telling me, no worries, let's do it. And, um, and then, and then through that sex started becoming less excruciating, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, uh, I have, I have a vagina now, long story short, and, um, now it works perfectly fine. <laughs> um, okay. The second question, um, why no pubes or underarm hair? I get this one a lot. And I mean, the only way I can really explain it is how I've already explained it. Um, so androgen is the, you know, the hormone that kickstarts the male sex characteristics, which includes, you know, the, the pubes and, um, and the underarm hair and everything like that. Um, and because my body doesn't have androgen, I don't have underarm hair. If my body did have androgen, I wouldn't just have underarm hair. I would have a dick and I would be a dude. <laughs> if I, if my body was, you know, <laughs> was cool with androgen doing its thing, but it's, it's definitely not. So, um, yeah, that's the only way I can explain it without androgen. I'm not going to be growing any hair or a penis or anything like this. It just ain't happening for me. And it kind of ties in with another question that I get asked that says, you've said you don't have BO, how does that work? And this one I actually had to research because um, first of all, all of the information that I got told and all of these pamphlets and everything that I read, I read when I was 17 and I've retained most of this knowledge and it's easy to find, but I don't it's still kind of niche, you know, I can, I can scour the internet for specific facts and everything like this, but, um, I don't really have someone I can call who is the expert in it. And is going to tell me exactly how everything works. And, um, if I can't find something on the internet, like this is just an example. Um, uh, my other intersex friend and I, uh, who has complete androgen insensitivity syndrome as well. Uh, she, uh, she and I were saying, I wonder if we have a G spot in our butt, like, like, like dudes. And, um, I was like, how do I find this out? Because like, I, I just, what do I search? It's too niche. And I was thinking, I was like, oh, I mean, I can't really just call up my specialist and be like, uh, Hey, do, do we have a G spot in our butt? But, um, I ended up finding it somewhere on the internet through my research. And uh, yeah, I found out we don't because we don't have prostates uh, because again, the androgen, it didn't let us do that. <laughs> but yeah, the, sorry. Anyway, back to the BO. Um, I researched it and I found something very interesting. So androgen plays a role in the production of 
apocrine sweat glands, which are located in the areas such as the underarms, the groin, and the scalp. And these glands produce a more pungent, thick type of sweat than the eccrine glands, which are all throughout the body and are responsible responsible for cooling you down. So there's two types of sweat glands. One of them is like all throughout your body and it's the sweat that cools you down. And then the other one is a hormonal sweat, which is pleasantly described as thicker and more pungent. Um, and the apocrine sweat glands do not function properly. Again, because of the androgen. It's all because of the androgen for me. <laughs> um, and then also, uh, this is another thing. I don't know if it's the case for everyone with androgen and sensitivity syndrome or complete. Um, but for me and a lot of my friends as well, we, um, we don't get oily hair or oily skin. Um, and it's because yeah, something to do with the androgen and the production of sebum in your skin and your scalp. So it's interesting. Um, yeah, I rarely have to, uh, wash my hair because it really never gets oily. I basically only use conditioner because shampooing my hair really dries it out. All right. This is two questions in one, uh, but they're kind of about the same thing. It's so if you're intersex, are you considered a cisgendered non-binary person? And can you explain your gender identity and your gender? Um, and what people need to understand is that intersex in itself is not one whole complete third gender. Like there's like male, female, intersex. Because intersex is an umbrella term for a multitude of natural biological variations. Intersex encompasses so many different variations and um, yeah, it, intersex isn't one thing in itself. Um, and there is so many different ways that you can be intersex. So to say that you are born as a cisgendered non-binary person, like I, I don't think it's accurate to say because yeah, I mean, a lot of people, a lot of people who are intersex um, feel just one gender and it doesn't really interfere much with their life at all. And, um, and they would say that they just, associate with being the gender that they were born as um, or assigned at birth or whatever. And I think because there's such a wide range of variations of intersex and because it is a very complicated, complex topic, um, it's just important to respect that an intersex person can just identify with however the hell that they want as well as everyone else. But you know, it's it's a tricky card that we've been dealt, which is kind of unusual to what is typically dealt to, to everyone else. So yeah, you, you just have to, you know, let us fucking figure it out and, and let us be able to identify with what whatever we want to fucking identify with. Um, <laughs> because no one else is going to fucking understand, you know, what, what, it, what it feels like to be born this way. And, um, you know, the different types of feelings that it brings up in you in, in terms of your gender identity. And for me personally, I just don't even know what my gender is because it's so debatable. Um, you know, depending on who you're talking to, like I, I had this guy in the comments. I mean, okay. I take my gender is non-debatable because I decide what my gender is, but like my sex, you know, is, is debatable. <laughs> uh, cause they're different. Um, there was a guy in my TikTok comments who was trying to fight me and he was saying, oh yeah, like intersex isn't a real thing and it's just a mutation and you are basically one or the other gender, but you have a mutation. And um, I was like, it is, it is called intersex and it's real. And if we were going to say that intersex people, let's say, for example, myself is one gender with a mutation okay, so am I a male with a mutation or am I a female with a mutation? Because I technically am a male with a mutation because 
if I didn't have that receptor gene damaged on my X chromosome, I would be a regular male. But I can guarantee that he is was <laughs> trying to fight me and say that I was female with mutation, but actually I was not born female with a male characteristic. I was born from like a male a male chromosome and then I I what? Yeah. So I don't even know. So what's the right answer? Um, and I think the right answer is that I'm just whatever the fuck I want to be. And so is every other intersex person because it's just so confusing and there's just so many different ways that you can look at it, but it's all confusing and it's all complicated and it's all nothing to do with anyone else. And so they don't really have (laughs) enough structure around us to delegate what we're going to be. Um, so we should, yeah, just, just let us be whatever the hell we want and let everyone else as well. Next question. Oh, kind of in the same realm as the last it's, if you were not intersex, do you think you would still identify with they, them pronouns? Um, and I'm unsure because if I wasn't intersex, I would be a guy. If I wasn't born intersex, um, I, yeah, would have formed as a guy and I would have had a completely different life experience. So, uh, yeah, it's difficult to say because I, I don't, I don't even know, like I, I would have had a completely different life and it would be just be different. Um, I don't know if I would still feel non-binary and, you know, even when I say this, I, I feel maybe um, me being intersex has, oh, discovering that I'm intersex and then coming to terms with it and then all of this stuff has kind of um, put me on the path of like identifying as non-binary, but I, I can't be sure because I might have been born, you know, a cisgendered male and still have felt non-binary, you know, I don't know. Um, but yeah. The next question is a tricky one, but I get asked this one a lot too. Despite being told that you cannot have children like me, I'm sorry to hear that you can't have children. What do you think of adoption instead? And I think this is a very complicated question um, because I just don't know where I stand with it. I'm definitely not against it. And, um, growing up my whole life, even before I found out I was intersex, I was always open to adoption. I was, I was thinking about having kids when I was very young. I was already like planning my whole life and my family. And I was like, yeah, I'd adopt kids. Um, and then after I was, you know, found I was, uh, I was intersex and they were just saying like adoption will be the easiest, um, option for you if you want to have a family. And, you know, I've always thought that it was, you know, a very beautiful thing, but the more I research into it, um, the more complicated it seems to be, you know, of course. And, um, I think it's, you know, very important to prioritize the safety of, you know, the child, um, and also respect the wishes of the family and community that they come from. Um, but yeah, I don't know what I think about it and I don't know if I, I mean, I guess I'm open to it. Um, but I have a long road ahead of me in terms of like researching and, um, and yeah, really figuring out where I stand with it because at the moment I just don't know. I haven't, gotten a chance to like I know that there's loads of adopted people out there that are so happy with their lives and um but I also know that there's a big community of um adopted kids who feel really strongly against it and um yeah I need to delve myself deeper into that side of everything and figure out whether or not it's going to be something that I want if I mean, when I decide to have kids, because I'm pretty sure that I'm going to. Um, And yeah, 
I mean, there's other options for me as well. I mean, not having my own, but um, there's options. And in terms of adoption, I'm just not sure. I'm sorry if that was vague, but that's my answer. But lots of people consider adoption. I know lots of intersex people who adopt children and they're very, very happy. Um, uh, this is a question. The first part of the question is, is your DNA X, Y? Yes. Um, why keep your balls? Do they do anything realistically? Well, my testes, um, are only controlling my hormone production. So yes, realistically, they do a lot for me without them. I would have to be on hormone replacement therapy for the rest of my life. Um, the only reason I would get them removed um, is if they were to become cancerous, which there is a chance that they could become cancerous, but it is the tiniest, tiniest amount more than, you know, all of the other organs in my body. So my amazing, awesome doctor, um, that I've had for like 10 years now, we just get them monitored regularly and they haven't changed. Like I've got a great relationship with them. They're chilling. They're doing their thing uh, completely unnecessarily to, to get them removed. Um, and hopefully I will never have to. Um, but yeah, I'm keeping them in there because they're doing their thing. You know, they're very happy living inside me. Okay. Also a common one. I was just wondering, given this, what is your sexuality? Um, and it is complicated because, um, growing up, I always knew that I really liked women ever since I watched Lara Croft Tomb Raider. Um, and I was having really massive crushes on girls. Uh, I didn't maybe necessarily know that they were crushes, but, um, I was, yeah, just always having these very intense feelings for girls. Um, and I didn't come out until I was um, in my late teens because I was deeply, deeply in the closet. And I was like, I even though it was so obvious to everyone else that I was clearly gay as hell. But um, yeah, I just was, yeah, trying not to admit it to myself, uh, <laughs> the classic. And, I, and it was also confusing because I felt romantically attracted to men. Um, you know, I was having crushes on guys and obviously for the first section of my life, I wasn't experimenting with, uh, girls cause I was too nervous. <laughs> um, but I was, I was with guys, but I felt nothing. I felt, you know, romantically attracted to them. Um, but it was like trying to get wet over a brick wall. Like thinking of doing something physical with a woman for me was like, oh yes, that's everything. That makes sense. And then with men, it was just nothing. But I wanted to hold their hand. I wanted to kiss them and I wanted to like have a boyfriend and stuff like this. But um, yeah, it was, and then it all changed Um uh, yeah, and this was another reason why like sex was even even more painful for me because I really wasn't that turned on. Um, and that was until I fell in love with uh, a male friend of mine and he became my first uh, long-term relationship. And then it was like pff, floodgates. And then I realized I was demisexual, <laughs> which is what I identify as now, um, which means that I really don't feel um, turned on unless I am really emotionally connected to somebody. Um, and also I identify as pansexual, so no gender, any gender. Um, uh, as long as I am emotionally connected to someone, it's going to be an amazing time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, is this because I'm intersex as well? I think it's just, I'm, I think I'm just gay. <laughs> and my uh, my brother and my sister are also queer as well and um they are both cisgender so that's the gene that we carry I don't think it has anything to do with me being intersex and um yeah and then I have a whole other you know 
potentially um, uh, triggering for some people ideology about sexuality, but I will definitely get into that in another podcast. Today is not the day for that, but I have, you know, I have my thoughts on sexuality and what I think about sexuality as a whole, but (laughs) yeah. The next question is, can intersex people be biological parents? Yes, absolutely. Intersex people can be biological parents. Um, It just depends on what type of intersex you are and how that intersex condition affects your reproductive system um obviously I've said this multiple times I can't I can't do it but yes many intersex people can yes this is a typical how common is it um it's it's hard to say because it is estimated to be 1.71 point nine percent of the population um but it's also very highly debated um considering who you talk to and um who like what 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 the whole debate is about because there are lots of people who define intersex in a smaller genre and lots of people who think that intersex is a larger scope of things um for example Some people believe that um, polycystic ovaries is an intersex trait. And if that is the case, I'm not saying it is. I'm not saying it isn't. I don't know. doesn't really matter. But um, if polycystic ovaries is an intersex trait that really already makes it a lot more people that are are born with intersex traits. And 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 there's other things like polycystic ovaries as well that some people view as an intersex trait and and then it grows and grows and then it's a large part of the population but I mean for my uh complete androgen insensitivity syndrome I think it's like one in 20,000 births I'm pretty sure um yeah I think or maybe that's just the intersex statistic okay I don't know I probably should have researched that (laughs) but you know you can too um okay this next one how do I get tested for being intersex if you think that you might be intersex or if there's something a little unusual going on for you you have to go to a doctor you will have to get tests like blood tests imaging tests, hormonal tests, maybe like a physical exam and everything like that. But yeah, you're just going to have to go to a doctor and and maybe get them to refer you to a specialist because not just any doctor is going to be able to look at you and and tell you that you're intersex. I mean, good luck with that. Most of them have no idea what it even is. Um, (laughs) No shade, but also shade. Um, But yeah, if you go to your doctor and say, I want to see... like a specialist um, and then do your research and try and find someone near you that actually, you know, knows what they're talking about, a gynecologist or something like this. Shout out to my gynae who's the best. Uh, She definitely knows what she's talking about and I'm so glad that I have her because she made me feel so safe when I, when I walked into that room. Like I, it's funny because the, the woman who diagnosed me, um, she, I was the first person that she had ever diagnosed with being intersex. And then um, she referred me. So I got referred from a GP to this person. And then this person referred me to my amazing gynecologist. And um, then I walked in there and I was like, at this point, this is when I was in my like traumatic, like what's happening to me phase. And then she walks in and she's just so like blase, just being like, oh, cool you're into sex like nice Uh, just making me feel so fucking happy and chill about it and she was just like oh yes no no need to worry we don't need to remove your testes like no way um yeah love that woman (laughs) what's the best way they recommend parents approach it these days I mean the best way to approach it is to start early you know there's not going to be any right time when the kids you know 11 12 and you know they're starting to learn about the 
how people age and they're about to enter high school and all of this stuff's going on. And then you're like, oh, by the way, you're intersex. It's not a good idea. So um, I think for any complicated topic nowadays, they um, they just talk about it from very, very early age. Um, you know, you would, you would, that's why they have, you know, books. I'm not sure if they have intersex books, but um, maybe they do, but they have, you know, kids picture books that have complicated topics, but explain it in language that they can understand. And then as they get older, you explain a little bit more, a little bit more. And also very important, you have to respect this human being's autonomy and don't be fucking with their (laughs) genitalia or anything like that. I know that doesn't really happen much nowadays, but you know, you have to respect that, you know, your child is different and, um, you have to encourage that and, uh, make them feel safe and, you know, let them be whoever they want to be and introduce it from a very young age and just say, this is like, what's happening. And then as they're growing, they're learning more. And when they're old enough, they can decide how they want to identify. And, um, yeah, also support groups. Something my mum did, fucking bless that woman. She's amazing. You know, she was scouring the internet and she found this support group and then she, you know, was like, we're going to America and then flew me to America and it was, you know, at that point in time, you know, like my mum was going through chemo and everything and she was just like went so out of her way to try and, make me feel safe and, um, supported and got like, yes, parents of intersex children, you know, you need to be showing a lot of support and, and making them feel like this is something that's completely normal, which it is. And I've been saying that I've always said that. Okay. This person said, besides the obvious, are there lots of negatives about being intersex? Did you have to get implants or did you hit puberty eventually? In fact, I don't find that there's anything negative about being intersex. I mean, I mean, obviously about the, I can't have children in the way that I would wish, but there is nothing else that I find negative about it. I mean, if you asked me this fucking 10 years ago, there's a whole list of things I would say, but now it really, it, it, I mean, it really doesn't affect my life so much. It's not, you know, something that I feel is a negative thing. It's just very neutral and natural. It just is what it is. And yeah. And now actually is a positive thing because I mean, for me, I love the fact that I can talk about this and spread awareness and interact with other intersex people and, you know, feel like I can celebrate who I am. Um, But day to day, I am not experiencing anything negative. You know, every now and then there's a really terrible comment from some person who is just a bit silly but water off a duck's back jinx monsoon water off a duck's back I'm telling you like being intersex is great <laughs> if, if there's anyone watching this who is intersex have just found out they're intersex and they're like oh why me it's like trust me this this is really really such a neutral natural thing and it's time to start celebrating who you are Oh, and the implants thing. No, I didn't get implants. Um, my, I was not, you know, developing. And then I went to my doctor and I was like, what can we do about this? Because I want to have big titties. What am I going to do? Am I going to get surgery? Like what's going to happen? Um, and then she put me on estrogen because my estrogen is just a little bit lower than, um, the average female. And she was like, we can put you on estrogen, you know, you don't necessarily need it, but you do have low estrogen. So it might kickstart something, probably will kickstart something. And I was like, cool. So I started taking estrogen and then like, poof, I got like these gorgeous 
titties and um, it was great and I loved having them and they were super big. And then I stopped taking estrogen because I just really didn't like being on it. It made me so emotional and um, also my boobs were so sore all the time and um, yeah, so I stopped and then now I don't have those big tits anymore, but it's fine. It was nice while it lasted. <laughs> um, do you have any medical health issues as a side effect of being intersex? Um, I don't really have any serious medical issues. Um, obviously, my testes have to be monitored every year. Um and I have low estrogen, which means that I have uh, a lower bone density. So my bones are like a little bit fragile, but lifting weights and um, having calcium supplements and stuff like that is um, sufficient enough to, you know, keep them strong. But yeah, other than that, nothing. Super happy, healthy, <laughs> bright eyed and bushy tailed. This person said, super personal, so feel free to ignore, but do you feel pleasure during sex? And a thousand percent, I do. Yes. I mean, it. the only reason I wasn't feeling pleasure from sex at the beginning was because I was, you know, trying to fit a cucumber in a coin purse, so to speak. And it was, it was not a pleasurable experience. Um, uh, but like, you know, when I was having me time, you know, it was great. I was having the best time ever. And now that I am able to do the thing, also great. You know, as long as I'm turned on, it's just as good as anyone else. <laughs> or so I can assume. Okay, another one that I get, this wasn't a question, but I have gotten this is, do intersex people, or like specifically my intersex people, uh like have the O similar to like male or female. And I can only assume that it's similar to a female orgasm, but apparently there's something to do with like the cervix when you orgasm. And obviously I don't have a cerv cervix. So sometimes I wonder, um, cause also I, like a group of um, CAIS girls and I were all talking once and um, we were saying, yeah, like, after we orgasm, sometimes we feel really, really tired. And then we were like, kind of like a dude. And we were like, maybe we have orgasms like a dude. I don't know. But yeah, I can't be sure. And I'll never find out. So <laughs> who knows? Okay. So this is actually the last question. Um, and this is more to do with um, my gender identity, I guess. Uh, but how would you feel, what would it be like if you had friends and a partner that just saw you only as a woman? And I think this is an important thing to talk about for like non-binary people as well as intersex people. Everyone has their own way of expressing their gender identity and everything like that and how important it is and how validating it is for someone's close friends and family and strangers to get their pronouns right or identify them correctly. Um, and for me, I don't know if anyone I meet will ever really see me as anything other than a woman. And it sounds kind of sad, but it just is what it is until, and I mean, this is just how I feel and I'm not, you know, excusing like people who feel offended when people get their pronouns wrong or, you know, if, if their friends and everyone like are not seeing them as what they really identify as. But for me, I feel like unless I'm going to start dressing really super masculine and, you know, presenting more masculine, I just feel like no one's really going to see me as not a girl because I'm very, very feminine. I mean, there's, I, I, I don't know if there's one masculine thing about my appearance of her, apart from maybe the fact that I've broad shoulders. I don't know. But, um, yeah, I definitely have like a, a masculine side once you get to know me and everything like that. But 
I don't blame people for for not always thinking about me as intersex, you know, or always thinking about me as non-binary um, because, I mean, for me, I'm not really putting that much effort into trying to, like, encourage people to see me that way. Like, there are certain things that I prefer. Like, obviously, I want to – I prefer to be, you know, called – they, them, or not be called a woman or a girl or anything like this. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, like fucking call me what you want. I don't really care at this point because I'm, I just know what I am. I know what, how my body feels, how it feels to be in my body and to be in my mind and to have had the life experience that I've had. And yeah, it's not really my problem. Like, the people who get it, get it. The people who don't, like, don't. And will they get it unless I'm I'm literally dressing like a guy and I'm like, who knows, you know? I don't really care at this point. And I know a lot of people do care and so you should care. But for me, I feel like the only pe- the only reason people know that I'm intersex is because I never shut up about it. Um, but I'm not, yeah, I don't really know. Where am I going with this? Wrap it up. <laughs> um... Yeah. At the end of the day, I know that I'm intersex and I identify with that and I identify as being something that isn't male, isn't female, but just, as I have said before, my glorious, wonderful self. Um, And yeah, I hope that this podcast was illuminating in some way. I hope that I have answered some of the commonly asked questions. Um, and I hope you've learned something. Um, I had fun talking, so I hope you had fun listening. And next time I'm going to be finally interviewing people and I am really excited about embarking on this journey. Um, I have, you know, my whole list, I have a list of like, all of the people that I want to interview and I'm getting really buzzed about it. Um, and I can't wait to go on this journey, you know, with everyone who's listening and, um, yeah, make the world a more safe place for interesting and sexy humans. All right. Goodbye, everyone. Uh, stay tuned for the next episode. First interview. It's going to be very exciting. Can't tell you when exactly it's going to be, but, Stay tuned and um, stay interesting and sexy. Bye.